Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys here in Maryville and everybody online and in Knoxville. If you've got a Bible, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 will be there in just a little bit. Starting a new series today called Together and uh, super excited. How many of you guys are puzzle people? You like to put together puzzles? Anybody? Uh, for us, it usually happens around the holidays for whatever reasons or we're on vacation. It's like that's when we pull out the puzzles. But, but what I love about kind of, you know, putting together a puzzle, you got to kind of have a strategy, right? And so how many of you, you like your strategy is kind of like build the flat edges first and then kind of go, yeah, kind of got to do that. That's what I kind of work on because you can't just take a piece and go, oh, I like this piece. I want to put it where it goes. And it's like, well, I don't really know where it goes yet. I've got to kind of build the structure and it just kind of takes patience to kind of, you know, begin to put the pieces together. But uh, what, what I do love about, you know, just the idea of a puzzle is like, look, every, every single piece is shaped differently. It's got a different color. It's got, you know, its own kind of character uh, alone. You don't really know what that is. You don't really know what it's going to be. But then as the picture begins to develop, you start to see more and more the big picture. And I don't know about you, but I need the big picture to be able to put together a puzzle. Like on the box, I've got to see that. And when you can see that big picture, it's, it gives you a framework to begin to actually work on the puzzle, right? Well, what I love about God's church is that in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a puzzle. You as an individual, uh, to, you know, when you're, when you're alone, you've got your own unique background, uh, gift set, skills. Uh, you have your own story um, and, 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 and it's great. But alone, uh, it just doesn't quite feel right. You know, you need a church. You need to see the big picture and you need to begin to find your place in the ministry of God's church. And when you do that, you realize that, man, God uses all different shapes and sizes and different backgrounds to come together to form the big picture of what he wants to accomplish in his church. And I want you to know that every piece to the puzzle matters. Every single one of you is valuable and is needed in God's church for us to complete the picture, for us to be the church that God wants us to be. And so today, I wanna spend some time talking about God's big vision and picture for every church and then kind of dial in uh, specifically on our part as Foothills Church in that. And so we start with the mission of the church. What is the mission of the church? Well, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave the disciples the great commission. And so I wanted us to turn to that. This is what every church, not just Foothills, but every church must and should be about. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, every church is and should be about this mission of making disciples. That is the heartbeat of God's church. That's what he is calling each of us to do. And so every single one of us in his church are owning a piece to that vision and picture. And, and, and so your, your role might not be to get up and preach on Sunday mornings, but you have a role. And so as a follower of Jesus, it's valuable and important that you begin to understand what you bring to the table and, what, what, and, and how God has gifted you and, and, and what gap you do get to fill in so that when we work together, we're able to accomplish way more than we ever could on our own for God's glory. Now, churches get sidetracked on this mission there's a lot of dying churches. Churches are, are closing their doors every single day in America. And one of the reasons that churches die is they simply become inward focused. They stop caring about the community. They stop trying to engage the community with the gospel. And they just kind of get this mentality of us four and no more. And there's no real outreach and there's no real, real presentation of the gospel. And so it just becomes inward focused. Sometimes churches just become comfortable I mean, let's be honest, we all like to be comfortable, you know, but, but as Alex, Pastor Alex was sharing just a minute ago, like God draws us out of our comfort zone, right? But, but we tend to want to be comfortable, so we don't want to have to serve. Don't ask me to serve, don't ask me to do stuff. I just want to come and sit and go home. Don't ask me to give. I want to spend my money on myself. Don't, you know, don't, don't ask me to do that stuff. Why? Because we want to be comfortable. As a result, 
We don't want to give our time and energy and the church dies. Sometimes we're just distracted. We get distracted on building our business, our little kingdom, our brand, and we don't give our time, talents, and treasures to God's kingdom. And so there's a, there's a gap there where we're not actually using what God has given to us and stewarding those things well to advance the gospel. You see, the mission that Jesus gives the church is given to each individual and to each individual church. And so that's not going to change. That's going to be the mission until Jesus returns. But, but what we have to be honest about is as a follower of Jesus, if I'm not if I'm not doing my part, then I'm being disobedient. And if I'm being disobedient, then what do I have to do to get that right? Because, because one day we will stand before God and we want to hear those words, well done and good and faithful servant. And so I want you to hear this morning that the purpose of God's church is to make disciples. Now, every church might, is a little bit different because they're led by a different pastor and pastors have their own gift sets and passions. And so we, we all serve in different contexts and, you know, Having a church in Tennessee is different than having a church in New York or overseas somewhere. And so you, you contextualize the gospel in a way that, okay, here is what our community needs and here's how our community kind of hears. And, 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 and then you take the gospel to them and, and uh, begin to uh, share the love of God in that particular way. So there's going to be differences in churches, and that's a good thing. God uses a variety. Different churches reach different people. And so that's a, a good thing, but the, but the reality is we have to understand the big picture. And the big picture is that God's called us to make disciples. Now here at FC, the way that we uh, communicate this is we say that we exist to develop mature disciples of Christ in relational environments. So we just covered the develop disciple part and the why behind that. Jesus told us to do that. Now, you might have heard this and you say, why relational environments? What is a relational environment? Well, it's a small group, it's a men's group, it's a women's group, it's a discipleship group, it's a, it's a group of two or three people where one person is actually teaching and training and equipping the others to grow in their relationship with Christ. And so there's, there's a, a few different vehicles to accomplish this, but it's simply a group of people that get together with the purpose of one person discipling the others, right? So why would we do that? Why is that important? Well, one of the reasons it's important and one of the reasons why we make disciples in relational environments is because Jesus was a relational disciple maker. In Mark chapter three, it says, he, Jesus, appointed 12, whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him, be in a relationship with him, and he might send them out to preach. So Jesus gathered these 12 men together to teach, train, invest in them, to build a relationship with them, and the purpose of that relationship was to then send them out to preach and, and start the church and grow the church and make more disciples. And so every single one of us fit into this. Jesus wants a relationship with you. You need a relationship with someone who's a little bit further along than you are spiritually so that they can teach and train you. And as you grow, that growth is for a purpose. It is to take the gospel into your classroom, your college, your, your uh, campus, to take it into your organization, your business, your neighborhood, your family, right? You are sent into those places to preach the gospel and to share the gospel and to share the love of God. We make disciples in relational environments because God wired us to be in relationships. Genesis chapter two, it's not good for man to be alone. Now, some of you are extroverted and you get energized by being around people. And some of you uh, are more introverted. You, you don't get so energized being around people Right? But, but we know even for introverts, like we are created to be in relationships. We need each other to actually grow. We also make disciples in relational environments because we need others to mature as Christians. I need somebody that will teach and train me and equip me things I haven't learned or know about. Right? I need that in my life. I actually have a coach in my life that helps me with this. In Hebrews chapter 3 he says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day. Man, I need to be encouraged and challenged every day. Why? Because if I don't get it, uh, it, it, he says, do this so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So if we don't have that encouragement on a regular basis, daily from God's word and God's people, then the tendency is to become inward focused and selfish and our heart becomes hardened by sin's deceitfulness and we care only about ourselves. That's why we need to be here on Sunday. 
That's why we need to be in relational environments so that we can continue to grow. We make disciples in relational environments also because we can do more together than we can alone. Romans chapter 12 says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function so that we though many are one body in Christ. So, so we're one body, but again, like pieces to a puzzle, we bring different gift sets and different um, abilities with different resources. We, we bring that into the mix so that together we work as one body, even though we are individually equipped. See, every single person is valuable and we need you. We need you in the life of our church. We, we need you to invest. We need you to be a part of the ministries. We need you to serve because we believe God is doing something special here. And some of us just haven't quite engaged yet. And I think that's the problem with a lot of churches. There's a lot of division in churches. There's a lot of churches that are dying because people just simply aren't willing to engage. They're not willing to make sacrifices. They're not willing to prioritize God's mission in their life. And they just want to focus on their own needs. In the life of our church, we have seen time and time and time again, God bring people and, 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 and people connecting and giving and serving. And it's what has made our church what it is today. We started 14 years ago, and uh, we started in a, in a school in town, and, and when we began, our heartbeat was we want to develop mature disciples of Christ in relational environments. We knew that we could, could, could never do this unless we joined together. In fact, I would say I've learned a lot of leadership lessons and ministry lessons over these 14 years, but the greatest one is that we can do far more together than we ever could alone. And, and so FC is a story of hundreds, yes, thousands of people who have joined together and served together to do and to experience what we have today. We started in a school and back then there wasn't like social media for churches. And so uh, this was one of the pictures that our photographer took. It's a terrible picture. And uh, it's because I was the photographer. <laughs> and this was like two minutes before I got up to preach. I was like, oh, we should probably remember this day, iPhone snap. And that was it. And so it's kind of like one of the relics of our church. <laughs> it's like all we got. But uh, that was us, like 130-ish people meeting in a school. And we, you know, week in and week out, we were looking for a place like a, 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 a brick and mortar uh, place to actually move into and be a real church, have a real home, Right because we were setting up and taking down every day uh, or every week at the school. And so one day I was driving by this particular area and I saw Thunderworld. And uh, how many of you remember Thunderworld? Anybody? Uh, for those of you that are new to the area, it was like a bowling alley. It was a restaurant. It was an arcade, batting cages, go-karts, all this fun stuff. And it was dark and nobody was home. And I was like, that is interesting. And sure enough, we started to pray I came that day when I drove by and I laid hands on that wall right there. And I said, God, if you would give this place to this church, we will do all that we can for your glory. And we asked and we prayed and sure enough, God actually gave us the facility. And our first gathering looked like this. <laughs> it was kind of a mess before we painted, before we renovated anything. This was like arcade games kind of removed. And then we were just kind of flooded in that night. And again, about 130, 150-ish people. But our first day uh, was in February uh, 27th of 2011 in that space. And uh, that day after I preached, we all went outside and we held hands together and we prayed and barely made it around the building, by the way. So we didn't have enough people, but we did. And we dedicated and we prayed uh, that God would use that facility for his glory and for his honor. I actually sat by um, Tim and Kim. They were on the front row with me in the first service. Hit. That's them and Tina Boyd. And then I was kind of making fun of Brandon Riggs and his mutton chops on the side. I'm glad he's cut those off. But anyway, um, I'll share this on social media today. If you know them, you can say, wow, you guys look great. Um, but that was one of those days where we just, gosh, man, God just, it was an answered prayer. And one service went to two services and God took that 130 people and in that first year doubled us and now we were running 300 and we were like, okay, well, we have to renovate for kids space and 
So what, what we see, what we used to call it Kid Street on the far end of the building, that hole where all the toddlers are today, uh, is what we did first. And, and then we were like, well, we've got this huge like bowling alley. Um, we should do something with that. And, and again, we just casted vision. We didn't have money, but we, we casted vision. We said, look, we, it's going to take X amount of dollars, we think. And, and uh, if you will give, uh, we could have a, a real auditorium and it could be great. And God's people responded and gave and man, God did it. And this turned into what we call the theater. And one service turned into two services, turned into three services over the next uh, two years God grew that church to about a thousand people. And, and then in 2016, we were like, okay, what, what's next? We really need to buy this land. We really need to build an auditorium to continue to advance because during that time, people were getting saved and, and uh, people were joining small groups and ministries are being created and just a, an exciting time. And, and uh, as we were, we were just praying, I was also feeling the stress like as a young pastor because we had Yes, we had buildings, but we also had like payments. We had big boy payments. And, and uh, so we, we didn't, a lot of new people, but a lot of new people, they don't not necessarily give uh, for a while. And that takes time. And so I was stressing like never before. It was one of the darkest, like stressful moments of my life, just uh, begging God, God, please provide. Uh, we, we need this. We need that. You know what our needs are. We took this step because you told us to, right? And so we're, we're praying and begging. And, and, um, and, and, and then one day, it was, uh, it was December 21st, and it was, um, what year was it? Uh, 2013. It was 2013. And the week of Christmas, right? Busy, um, lots of stuff happening, and I'm praying all this. And then I get a phone call from a police officer, and, said, and he said that a, a truck has run into your church. I was like, what? What does that mean? So I rush over here and sure enough, this tractor trailer like crossed the highway up the hill and just barreled into where our kids area is uh, and half of his truck just like plowed into our building. And thank God nobody was here, nobody was hurt. But it was kind of one of those days where have you ever been praying and asking God to do stuff and then it just gets worse? You're just like, well, maybe God, you don't speak English. Like I don't, was I not clear enough? Like I needed help, not like more stress. And, and uh, what I didn't realize is like that was going to draw a lot of attention. So a church that like not a lot of people knew about, all of a sudden I was on the news in Knoxville. And we were in the news in Maryville and in the newspaper and all this stuff. And, and so the word kind of got out and God used that to really begin to grow our church. And um, next thing I know, we'd grown by almost 40% during that that six month span. And so it was incredible. And I'll never forget, we got the building kind of put back together by Easter uh, that year. And the newspaper article was Foothills Church uh, Children's Ministry Resurrected for Easter Sunday. <laughs> and I was like, that's a great title, man. Here we go. And, and sure enough, man, God, God grew the church and, and our, our, our family ministry, our kids and student ministries uh, were growing and, and God was just doing some incredible things in the midst of this. And so then in 16, we're like, okay, let's, let, we're in three services. We, we, we need to buy this land and we need to build so that we can uh, open up more seats for people to hear the gospel. We knew at that time that a lot of people from California were going to be moving here. Um, I'm just kidding. I didn't know that, <laughs> but God did. And so we, we, we took that step. I'll never forget, I had one lady laugh in my face and say, we would never be able to afford that. Oh, that hurt. That hurt me so bad. But I'm so glad she was wrong. And um, we continue just to pursue. People say, the church, did you see this? Did you see all the things that FC had? Did you, did you foresee Knoxville and all this? And like, no, I didn't see any of it. Um, all I knew is what the next step was. That's what God has done for me. And you've probably experienced this in your family and your business. Like you don't know the whole thing, but God reveals the next step and he's waiting. And he's saying, if you'll take that step, I'll reveal a little bit more. But you took the step and it was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And you took the next step and oh, wow. Now all of a sudden you've got this and you're like, whoa, God, right? That's how he tends to work. So here we are in this constant uh, renovation and uh, continued ministry. And, and then uh, we go into 2020 and COVID and it was just like, crash, right? And then we were online for about 14 weeks or whatever. And, and um, I'm praying and asking God, like, what do we do now? Like, do we 
you know, is this it? Like, how do we build this back? Just like most churches, we didn't know, but I just prayed and something just hit me. Like the moment we were in wasn't gonna stop the mission that we were on. And so we went to Matthew 25 and we, 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 we saw these ministries outlined and I was like, okay, this is, this is the make it count vision, right? We're gonna, we're gonna multiply our campus. We're gonna improve this campus and we're gonna create ministries. And so we created a ton of ministries that outlined, that Jesus outlined in Matthew 25 and and uh, we improved, uh, went in a building, uh, you know, renovation during COVID. Who does that? Well, we did. And, and uh, we redid the kids' space next door and the second floor. And, and we also took steps to plant Knoxville. And, and uh, during that season, started a small group and started uh, a Bible study there. And it began to grow. And, and God just blessed. The people gave. You gave. And as a result, fueled that vision. And God did it. And I want, you to, I want you to just really let this sit in for a moment. This is our Knoxville location, right? Not very many Christians will ever, listen to me, will ever be a part of planting a church. And so I think one of the greatest things God has done in our midst is allowed us to be a part of planting a church in a city that will have a church there preaching the gospel for generations to come. Your grandkids might be living in Knoxville one day, and this is where they're going to find Jesus, right? This is unbelievable. I want the weight of that to encourage us today. And I know that we're not finished, but, but what an incredible, incredible step that has been. And so some of you, I, I, I think, maybe are missing the idea of, of, of having a responsibility and having a place to serve in our church. And so In Ephesians 2, I want us to look at a couple of truths today that I think are going to bless you and remind you about who you are now that you're a follower of Jesus. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. He says, For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also were being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. A few truths that I want you to know. As a follower of Jesus today, you are a citizen in the kingdom of God. He says you're no longer a stranger or an alien, but you are a citizen of heaven. Yes, we might be American citizen, citizens, but our first and primary home is the kingdom of God. Heaven is our home. And so we make decisions. We live our life through the lens that you and I are citizens of the kingdom of God. And when you're a citizen of that kingdom, yes, you have rights, but you also have a duty, a role to uphold and build that kingdom as well. He says you're a citizen in the kingdom, but he also says that you're a member of God's family. You're a member of God's family, of of his household. Now, contrary to what a lot of people believe in our country, that you are not born a child of God, right? You're a child of God. I'm a child of God. All God's children. No, that is wrong. We're we're an alien. We're, we're, We're a stranger. We're an enemy of God until Jesus saves us. And, and, and how do we become a part of the family of God? Well, we recognize that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection happened because you were an enemy of God, broken, destined for hell. And then when you recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, you recognize that his death was paying for your forgiveness. And his resurrection proved that his death was gonna do that. If by faith you receive him into your life and you commit your life to him, when you do that, God says, okay, now I adopt you into the family of God. So as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you and I are one family because we have the same father. So we're adopted into the family of God. Now, when you are a part of the family of God, you have responsibilities. How many of you grew up in a household where your parents gave you some chores? You gave some responsibilities that you had to do? A few. All the young people are like, what are chores? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you grew up and you learned how to be responsible, right? You, you got a job and you learned how to get there on time and stuff. And, and we're, I don't think it's a secret part of our problem in our country is that 
the family is, is dying, like the family union uh, uh, unity in our families are just broken because we've got so much uh, divorce, we got absent fathers, and we got moms and dads that are home, but they're not really giving their kids any responsibilities uh, and, and, and encouraging them to do anything. So we've got a generation of an, an entitled kids that, that feel like things should just be given to them. If you run an organization and you've got some 20-year-olds on your staff, they're like asking for raises already. And you're like, what do you, what do you mean? Like you don't, you know? And so it's like confusing to the older generation, but that's part of the reality. And see, that same idea has crept into our church over the last 30 plus years. And, and that idea is that, well, I can just come and be a part and I can get served and I can get all the, all the you know, benefits, but I don't have to like do anything. And that's all a piece of the brokenness of our culture, I think, is because we have churches that don't, don't have Christians that, that feel a responsibility, that now that they're a part of the family of God, they've got a responsibility to take care of it and, and, and to grow it and to, in fact, build it. Now, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. And so I'll start with the good news first. And so to all of our Knoxville people, uh, we ran some numbers and and we wanted to see like how much growth that we've had uh, here and in Knoxville. And man, I'm telling you, attendance has grown, uh, giving has grown, people in small groups have grown. All of these numbers are great uh, church-wide, but there was one in particular on how many new people and, and, and like how much ministry, how many people are engaging and actually serving. And so the good news is, Knoxville, hold on to this, for you guys this year, you have actually grown your uh, serving ministry um, as, a, as a church by 36%. So that's incredible. Yeah, we should celebrate that. Way to go. It's almost 40%. So everybody in Knoxville, just kind of give some fist bumps there. That's incredible. Way to go. So what about Maryville? What about what's going on here? Well, um, you know how facts don't care about your feelings? Have you ever heard that? Uh, it's kind of been a popularized kind of statement recently. So this is just the, this is the stat, right? I don't mean to offend anybody, but, but the reality is for Maribel is that our people serving, you know, the number of growth is actually 1.7%. So if anybody's ever punched you in the gut, that's what it felt like for me when I got this stat this week. Like, whoa. So that just means a lot of the new people that are coming here, you haven't gone to base camp, you haven't gone to camp two, you haven't stepped in and served. And I get it, you come to the church, you're like, oh wow, it's big and it's cool and it looks like they got everything they need. So we're just gonna come and chill and just like soak it all in, man. Thank you guys. I get it. Um, some of you are like, oh, we've been serving for years, Trent, and we just need a break. And so we're just gonna back down. We travel a lot. And so we've got a lot of places we need to go, right? Okay, whatever. So some people maybe have backed out. So the reality is, I go back to your part of the family of God. You've got a responsibility to serve. We've got a responsibility. And in Maryville particularly, we need y'all to engage. We need you to take that step. Like, I don't know what we're waiting on, but there's a, there's a missing piece to the overall picture. And God has more for you. The rewards and the blessing of you discovering how he's gifted you and then actually using that is something that brings joy to our Life. And then finally here, he says, you and I are actually building blocks and building the temple and building the church. He says, we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. What he means there is we're built on their teaching, the truth of the apostle Paul and his, tree, his teaching. Like the early church fathers were, were, were building us on this truth, but most importantly, we're built on Christ Jesus himself, who is the cornerstone. You see, the church is built on Jesus as the cornerstone. The cornerstone was the most important part of building, the, building any building at this time. It kept everything straight and, and, and was the most important part of the foundation. See, our church is built on Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We are built on the word of God. We believe the word of God is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. And we trust it and believe it as such. And so what he means here is that as a part of the building, that means that we don't go to church. That means we are the church because the spirit lives in you. You're a part of the building. You are the building because you yourself, 
your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When by faith you receive Jesus, he lives inside of you. The Spirit lives inside of you, right? Now we are, are, are part of his family and his church. And let's go back to verse 21 and 22. In whom the whole structure, when we're joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Here's what this means. It means when God's family joins together, we will grow. You will grow spiritually. We will grow numerically. We will grow the influence of the gospel in this community. Right? We will elevate the name of Jesus when we come together, when each one of us plays our part. We begin to fulfill the overall big picture and big vision that God has for our church. Over the course of 14 years, we have sermon series like this where we cast vision. We remind who we are, the why behind the what and where we want to go. And we've casted vision. We've asked, okay, we're going to do a vision offering and we just want to ask you to give. It's a one-time gift. It's an ongoing commitment to give. And if if, if we give, then we're, we're able to fuel the vision into the future, what we believe God wants us to do. I don't know what it looks like in 10 years, but I know the next step. And so what I believe God is leading us to do is bless and expand. And this theme this year is together we bless and together we expand. Let me explain what that means. First of all, we seek to be a generous church. And so we want to financially bless and give away money to organizations and, and uh, people that are doing a great work here in this community and around the world. So we want to continue to, to give to Vapor Ministries, which is an organization that's in Haiti and Africa. Uh, you remember uh, Pastor Micah came and he spoke here a few months ago. We want to continue to give to what's called the Cooperative Program, which is uh, over 50,000 Baptist churches that cooperate and give to plant churches, train pastors, and uh, provide disaster relief ministry all over the world. And so if there's a disaster, hurricane, or whatever, Southern Baptists are the first people to go. And when we give towards that, it helps fund those projects. We want to continue to send teams to Zambia. And we want to continue to promote and provide resources for local ministries here in Maryville and Knoxville, things like FCA and, and uh, the PRC and Hope Resource Center. And uh, you can go online to thevisionoffering.com and see a, a list of all the uh, different organizations that we want to bless financially. And so when we give to the vision offering, we are blessing these ministries. And so the idea this year is to give just over $94,000 and bless each one of those areas. The second part of this is to expand. So together we expand. So a couple of things. Now, the first thing we know is that here in Maryville, we need land. And so we've been talking about that. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned it last year. God hasn't opened up the door. So I want to ask you to pray, pray, pray like you've never prayed before that God would open up the opportunity to do that. Uh, last year with the offering that was given, we were able to uh, do and, and, and finalize phase one of Knoxville. We were able to also uh, create our counseling ministry. So we were able to provide and, and currently are looking to hire a full-time counselor. So because you gave, we're able to do that. But we, in the meantime, have also really expanded the counseling ministry. So Pastor Todd has been training 15 plus mentors to help with that. He's been doing that. So it's, we've taken some huge steps um, in that ministry. And pray that we'll continue. And, and I say that because it kind of relates to land because future, long-term, if, when God gives us land, we want to create a counseling center here in Maryville that would bless the people in our community and, and serve a huge need that we think it's, it's here, but step one is obviously we got to have the opportunity. And I kind of feel like at this point, what, what God has just put on my heart is that the people need to give, we need to save, and then God will open up the door. And so uh, I don't know if that's this year, next year, or when, but that's why I want to encourage you to, to pray. And the second part of this expansion is the next renovation for Knoxville. Like they got in, it's working, kind of like when we were next door as a church. It's working, but we need to renovate so that it's like a real auditorium and real kids space uh, that will fit the needs of a growing church. And we believe that is going to at least be a million dollars, which takes us to a grand total of almost $1.7 million. This would fuel that vision, and we would be able to do this and uh, even more so with 
the funds that God gives. So my, my ask today is that you would begin to pray about this. I just wanna encourage you to begin to, to pray and ask God, how could we financially make a sacrifice to give towards the vision that God has for our church? I know that some of you, you probably don't have money in the bank, but you have assets. And so just as ideas, I wonder if there's something that God would call you to sell so that then you could give and provide. Some of you are great entrepreneurs and you could probably start a side gig and the whole point of the side gig would be to fund ministry. You know, what would it look like for you not to just keep starting businesses so that, so that your 401k grows, but that you started businesses that could fund ministries and make disciples? See, that's a part of the puzzle. You, know, you can be a part of a church that's dead and I promise you, they won't ask you for money. They won't be asking you to serve because there's nothing to do. There's no life in the church. But as long as that you're a part of FC and just, I'm just telling you, we've been doing this for 14 years. We always need more volunteers. We always need more resources because God's vision for our church continues to grow. And as we are faithful in giving, God is faithful in allowing us to see the fruit of our sacrifice. Dead churches are pretty inexpensive. <laughs> Growing churches are expensive. And so I wanna encourage you to pray and think about what God would encourage you to give. And I want you to just kind of put your mind back on this image for a minute. As we think about the big picture today and as we think about what God would have us to do, we are reminded that every single one of us has a part to play. Every single one of us has been gifted. God has blessed us in certain ways and he's calling us to be a part of his bigger vision, his bigger picture. And so if you're not serving, if you're not giving, then, then it's kind of a broken image, right? It's kind of a broken image of, of what God wants to do. And so it's not until we begin to put the pieces where they belong. It's not until we begin to realize, oh, this is what God wants me to do and how God wants me to serve. Little bit by little bit, you begin to see how God's vision comes into play. I don't know what it's gonna quite look like until I take the step to actually do my part. And again, without those of us in, 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 in serving and being a part, like it's a broken picture. And, I feel like in some ways as a church, there is some broken pieces right now. There's some, some folks that aren't playing their role that God is desperately uh, needing us to do. But when you do that, and I think you're gonna do that this year, here we go. Starts becoming a little bit clearer and a little bit clearer until finally we see the bigger picture. And so today I just wanna encourage you to begin to pray and to begin to ask God, how and what is he calling you to do? I don't care if you're in high school or a college student or you're you know, brand new to our church or anywhere in between, how will and does God want you to serve in this church right here, right now? Because every single one of you are now a part of the Foothills Church story. You're a part of the story. This isn't my story. It's not any individual story. You and I are a part of something bigger, something bigger that God created and started 14 years ago. And as we move forward as a church, it's up to you and me how we're going to take the step that God is calling us to take. And so let's pray. You can find out more at thevisionoffering.com. Learn more, pray more. There's envelopes in front of you. You can take those with you. You can give online, you can give in the giving stations, you can give at any time during this series, uh, but I wanna encourage you to begin to pray about it and think about it. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, I know that you are calling us into deeper waters. You're calling us, Lord, to take our next step as individuals, but that also means that we are taking a step as a church. And so Lord, I know that you are moving in the hearts of our people. I know, God, that you want us 
to get out of our comfort zones. You want us to serve you and trust you as we do so. You, you are desiring us to give faithfully as you have been faithful to us. And so today I pray that we would be reminded that you have been faithful in the past and that you will be faithful today and in our future. Lord God, we give you this series and this time as we pursue you and as we think about the big picture, the why behind the what, God, that you would inspire each of us to do our part. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.